Well, I'm very excited for the next speaker uh, because next we have Walter Matwaychuk, and he is a cognitive behavioral therapist. And he worked very closely with Dr. Albert Ellis and Dr. Aaron T. Beck, who are the founders of cognitive behavioral therapy. And he's the author of Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, A Newcomer's Guide. So I'm really excited to have somebody here talking about REBT and its relationship with stoicism. And his talk is also related to Epictetus. It's called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy in the Words of Epictetus. Well, thank you, Don. Um, I'd like to start off with thank you for, you for the hard work that you did to put this conference together. I'm sure that um, you and your entire Stoic team worked night and day to pull this off, and so far, so good. Um, your passion for the dissemination of Stoicism is truly inspiring. I am a clinical psychologist trained in rational and motor behavior therapy, and I had the good fortune of being trained by Dr. Albert Ellis. Ellis always said that REBT was an amalgamation of ancient and modern philosophy that borrows heavily from Stoicism. Given that REBT's roots lie in Stoicism, a few years back I set out to deepen my appreciation of REBT by studying Stoicism. The story begins in 1955 when Al uh, began what at that time was called rational therapy. It was a game-changing psychotherapy, a game-changing approach. At the time, he was dismayed with the ineffectiveness and inefficiency of psychoanalysis. He had been trained as a psychoanalyst. He was working in the real world and was facing people who had multiple problems, uh, many difficult problems. It's not surprising that he turned to Stoicism because REBT grew up in the rough and tumble streets of New York City. And unlike other cognitive behavioral therapies that followed in its wake, it really didn't pick carefully selected patients to develop an approach. It just took anybody coming into psychotherapy that needed help. And very often they came in with what would be multiple diagnoses or problems of living. Also, it should be kept in mind that over the six decades of his long career, Ellis had over 180,000 hours of face-to-face -face clinical time with patients, and I think wisely turned to philosophy both to craft a new psychotherapy and for his own personal strength, meaning, and happiness. There's a picture of Al in, at his 80th birthday party doing two things at once, which he often did. He's sticking his finger, testing his blood sugar, simply because um, he's, he was insulin dependent diabetic from the age of 40. And he lived to the ripe old age of 93 years, 10 months. So this was, and he died about 10 years ago. So for an insulin dependent diabetic, I think he used RBT to help him comply with a rigorous adherence to diet uh, in order to maintain uh, his health to the fullest extent. He also had quite a bit of health problems as a child, spent a lot of time in the hospitals, and probably was interested in coping from a very ripe young age. Actually, he was. My premise is that if you practice stoicism, once you get informed of REBT and understand some of its core concepts, you will like and use it. It's a self-help form of evidence-based cognitive behavior therapy. It's the pioneering form of cognitive behavior therapy. And, in my estimation, a philosophy which largely overlaps with Stoicism. It's, I believe that it can assist you in implementing the core principles of Stoicism and help you face the problems of daily living. So in the words of Epictetus, what I'd like to do is introduce you to the core concepts of REBT in order to show you how it links back to Stoicism and stands on the shoulders of Stoicism. It's not events that disturb people, it's their judgments concerning them. So make a practice at once of saying to every strong impression, an impression is all you are, not the source of the impression, then test and assess it with your criteria, but one primarily ask. Is this something that is or is not in my control? And if it's not one of the things that you control, be ready with the reaction, then it's none of my concern. 
Consistent with Stoicism, REBT argues that adversity in and of itself is insufficient to produce maladaptive, self-defeating emotional disturbance. REBT is very good about defining, um, it's very precise in defining its terms. And emotional disturbance is defined as emotional and behavioral reactions that are self-defeating, unhealthy, and undermine our primary goals of survival and happiness. Ellis argued that all other goals are subsumed under these two overarching goals. In 55, uh, when Al began to craft REBT, shortly thereafter, he introduced what has come to be known as the ABC framework, or ABC model of emotional disturbance. And this framework is very useful for showing uh, um, new patients that before, that, that, that that our attitudes about adversity, specifically rigid and extreme attitudes, largely create our emotional reactions. Before therapy, very often either people have no awareness of this concept or they're dimly aware of it, but they, more often than not, they wrongly attribute the, the, the cause of their emotional upset to some external source. In REBT, we quickly try to disabuse them of that idea. Now, like Stoicism, we don't believe that all negative emotion should be erased or eliminated. What we want to do is help people develop healthy negative emotions in response to adversity. And we believe that healthy negative emotions are emotions that help us, first they inform us that our desires and values aren't being met, and secondly they motivate us to uh, productive action. Here you see eight the basic eight healthy negative emotions of REBT. Here you see the, um, kiss, uh, the kissing cousins of those emotions, the unhealthy self-defeating counterparts. In the service of time, I'm going to restrict my uh, talk to the emotions of anxiety, anger, and self-disturbing envy, because I think the conference is aimed at talking about stoicism at work. And although all these emotions may be found in the workplace, I think anxiety, anger, and envy very often um, can be quite problematic in the workplace. So the characteristics of unhealthy negative emotions are that they're self-defeating. They interfere with living well with that which cannot be changed. They undermine our effort to improve things. They can lead to excessive behavior, aggressive behavior, making comments we later regret, uh, violence. They, um, or they can lead to avoidance, retreat, uh, escape behaviors, whether it be experiential avoidance where we uh, ex excessive use of alcohol, drugs, sex, or TV, or even exercise to avoid our experience of emotion, or as in the case of phobias where we literally retreat. Um, and they prevent us from having some degree of happiness in the presence of unchangeable adversity. The characteristics of healthy negative emotions are that they provide us with important feedback about that our goals are, uh, that our desires and values are not being met. They motivate us to creatively change that which can be changed to get more of what we want and less of what we do not want. They do not undermine our efforts towards our goals. They allow us to live well with adversity when it can't be changed. And I think this is particularly important. They allow us to have some happiness in the presence of adversity in our lives. My view is that there's always going to be a problem, uh, some sort of personal adversity, and it's, very, it's a very important skill to learn how to compartmentalize your reaction to that adversity so you can still have some happiness despite the presence of ongoing adversity. Now, let's talk a little bit about how the healthy negative emotions of anxiety, anger, and self-disturbing envy differ from the the, those were the unhealthy versions, to the self-helping or healthy versions of concern, productive anger, and productive envy. When we're anxious in the workplace, what do we tend to do? We may procrastinate. We may look to um, pawn off work to someone else that may be difficult. Or we may lack creativity and play things too safe. 
On the other hand, the healthy version that we want to transform our emotional reaction to is concern, whereby concern frees us for, for, for action. It enables us to take calculated risks, and it can facilitate creativity. I often say my two favorite negative emotions are concern and disappointment. Concern because it's like the brakes. It helps me stop doing something that I no longer should continue to do or not do something that I would be well advised not to do. Or it can help me initiate behavior, take action, no, no, not delay. Now, anger. Anger, a word, about, a word about language. The English language has a paucity of words when it comes to emotions. And unfortunately, anger, envy, and jealousy are three type of emotional words that we don't have good, healthy, and unhealthy counterparts to. So we modify the, emotion, the, the word by using the adjectives productive or constructive or functional. So I'm going to make a distinction between what I call productive anger, functional anger, and unproductive anger, unhealthy anger. Unhealthy anger interferes with acting in our long-term best interests. We may storm into our boss's office, say something we later regret. We may say something during a meeting that we later regret. Or, with, whereas with productive anger, we're able to be poised and act in our long-term best interest and assert ourselves in a way that isn't aggressive or to bite our tongues when it's the smarter thing to do. With regards, I think envy is particularly relevant to uh, uh, the workplace. When you have self-disturbing or unproductive envy, you tend to desire to undermine a colleague. You may actually do so in a passive-aggressive sort of way or in an overt sort of way. And you may aim to discredit the reputation. At the very least, you suffer because you, there's something that the colleague has that you covet, you obsess about it, and you think that they don't deserve it and you do deserve it. With productive envy, it's just the opposite. It frees you to model um, someone who's more senior to you or on your same level or even your junior, but who has a characteristic or a skill that you think you, is desirable. And it, it frees you to have perhaps even a mentoring relationship with someone else in the workplace. In the words of Epictetus, remember that you're an actor in a play, the nature of which is up to the director to decide. If he wants the play to be short, it will be short. If he wants it to be long, it will be long. And if he casts you as one of the poor, or as a cripple, as a king, a commoner, whatever the role assigned, the accomplished actor will accept and perform it with impartial skill. But the assignment of the roles belongs to another. I think Epictetus here is talking a little bit about accepting some of the conditions you're born into or that, or that you're facing. Here again, don't hope that events will turn out the way you want. Welcome events in whichever way they happen. This is the path to peace. Now, I think some of this, or I know, inspired Ellis. I think of Stoicism, uh, REPT, I think of Rationally Motive Behavior Therapy as something of a distillation of Stoicism. In REBT, we encourage patients to adopt acceptance, but we precisely define, uh, define what we mean. When we accept, we acknowledge that something exists which is against our goals and values, and acknowledge it would be preferable or highly preferable for this particular reality not to exist, And we acknowledge that it does not logically follow to conclude that the negative reality must not exist. Unlike um, resignation, we remain firm in our determination to change the negative existing conditions if they can be changed or to adjust constructively. We remain determined to adjust constructively when they cannot be changed. So it's an active form of accept acceptance. It's not the events that disturb people, it's their judgments concerning them. Death, for example, is nothing frightening, otherwise it would have frightened Socrates. But the judgment of the death, now that's something to be afraid of. So when we are frustrated, angry, or unhappy, never hold anyone except ourselves, that is, our judgments, accountable. In REBT, we encourage patients to adopt what we, call, what we call the principle of emotional responsibility. 
Ellis was a constructivist and argued that people largely disturb themselves about adversity. That emotional disturbance doesn't just happen to us. We are not victims of adversity so much as victims of our rigid and extreme attitudes about what other people do to us and what faith throws our way. We nearly always have a degree of choice. Humans, therefore, help adversity along by holding rigid and extreme attitudes. We create disturbance. We disturb ourselves. So I continually bring home the principle of emotional responsibility back to the doorstep of the patient, client, and say to them, how are you angering yourself about your colleague's misbehavior? How are you depressing yourself about being passed over for the promotion? And what attitude would, you, would help you to respond productively to the adversity and live well with it? In the words of Dryden, Wendy Dryden's a leading REBT practitioner in London and my good friend and mentor, it is not events that disturb people, it is their rigid and extreme attitudes concerning them. So he's taken Epictetus's well-known dictum and tweaked it in, um, in co consistent with REBT theory. So REBT is the original cognitive behavioral therapy, but we don't go after what would be considered to be inferences, one's perception of reality. What we first go after and believe primarily is at the core of emotional disturbance is a schema or a rigid attitude about adversity, however it is perceived. We, who knows how reality really is. Remember, it's not enough to be hit or insulted to be harmed. You must believe you're being harmed. If someone succeeds in provoking you, realize that your mind is complicit in the provocation. So Epictetus there is talking about the ABC model, although he's not referring to it as that. He's talking about the principle of emotional responsibility. And here, you know, very often we'll hear people talk about anger as something that is caused by their colleague who's not cooperating on a particular um, project. Now, in the process of psychotherapy, we encourage people to develop something of a tough-minded stance and to adapt and help themselves by relinquishing rigid and extreme attitudes and adopting flexible and non-extreme attitudes to adversity. So an example of a rational attitude we would want to work a patient towards is, I really wish my colleague would cooperate with me on this project, but he does not absolutely have to cooperate with me. I will choose a healthy attitude towards his uncooperative behavior and then take steps to influence him to whatever extent I, extent I can. Notice that this is a flexible attitude towards a negative state of affairs. The person is not getting what they want, and it's appropriate to be disappointed or concerned or perhaps even productively angered, de depending upon the importance of the situation. Now, Ellis, unlike, again, most other cognitive behavioral therapies don't emphasize this quite like REBT does. Ellis argued that we are born and reared to hold, to a greater or lesser extent, rigid and extreme attitudes. So what he's arguing is that this tendency we have to say we have to get things our way is really rooted in our bi biology. It's part of the human condition. The good news, folks, is that we are also born and reared to hold flexible and non-extreme attitudes. So we can think in a flexible way, but certainly we're going against the grain to some extent. And there's individual variability in the, in the relative strength of the rigidity found within the individual. So we, we may learn a little bit from our culture in terms of irrational thinking. But it's my belief that it's really biologically driven. And it's interesting clinically because it takes some, sometimes people will be a little bit more able to acknowledge their irrationality when you tell them it's part of your biology to some extent. We will never completely eliminate the irrationality that lurks within us, but we can do a great job of reducing its intensity, frequency, and duration with which it reveals itself. And so we're not taking a deterministic approach. We're really arguing that there's great 
um, um, potential for significant growth and self-actualization, but that you will always remain a fallible human and that you will not perfect yourself. In the words of Epictetus, we must undergo a hard winter training and not rush into things for which we haven't prepared. Likewise, REB, in REBT, we argue that we have to discipline our thinking, train ourselves to detect, challenge, and relinquish our rigid and extreme attitudes. And through deliberate effort, we can adopt healthy self-defeating, se excuse me, we can adopt healthy self-helping flexible and non-extreme attitudes. However, no matter what kind of therapeutic progress we make on our own or with a psychotherapist, we need to guard against backsliding because that biological toe of demanding that we do things perfectly well or have things our way is going to can always be there. It's never going to get stamped out. It's my belief that REBT is not just a psychotherapy, and this is one important way in which it differs from other cognitive behavioral therapies. I actually think it's also a philosophy. Now, it's an evidence-based psychotherapy um, that can be used to treat psychiatric or psychological disorders, but at the same time, I do believe it's a philosophy. As a therapy, it teaches people to question and relinquish their, their attitudes that are self-defeating, and it suggests values to live by. Learning that does not lead to action is useless, so said Epictetus. In the process of psychotherapy, we're not just going to have Socratic dialogue about, about rigid and extreme attitudes and whether they have any functional value, hoping to show the patient they don't have much functional value that, and they're not valid. But we're going to encourage people to go home and teach themselves REBT by listening to audio, doing bibliotherapy, perhaps going to my website and listening over and over again until they see that it is their rigid and extreme attitudes that they use to disturb themselves. Then we're going to encourage them to forcefully dispute their irrational attitudes. Practice through repetition healthy rational attitudes. I don't have to do things perfectly well, although I'd like to, that would be lovely. And most importantly, act in a ration, on these at, rational attitudes. We, we argue that real attitudinal change comes when people live in harmony with their rational attitudes, walk the talk, and that goes for the psychotherapist as well. We want to model our rational thinking. The theory holds that there are four basic attitudes that we want to target in the process of psychotherapy or our own help. Again, this is something you can teach yourself. There's one primary attitude and three derivatives. This mother of all rigid a uh, attitude, this mother um, attitudinal process was humorously, humorously referred to by Al as masturbation. He also referred to it as demandingness. And its chief quality is that it's rigid, dogmatic, and anti-scientific. Now, it's usually expressed with words like must, should, we may leave out the absolutely should part, but, it's, but the, the, the characteristic of the statement, the, the attitude is rigid. It's not the words we're targeting for change, it's the underlying attitude. So for example, we can use these words in a conditional way, which is completely consistent with empirical data. For example, if you want to be fit, you must exercise regularly. Conditional logic. However, some people might go, and there, I absolutely must have a perfect body and a perfect physique. And such an absolutistic attitude will lead to excessive dieting, excessive exercise, uh, perhaps body dysmorphic disorder. In the words of Ellis, assume that just about all your dogmatic musts fall into three major headings. One, I absolutely must perform well on important projects and be approved of by significant people, or else I am an inadequate, unlovable person. Two, other people, particularly those I've cared for and treated well, absolutely must treat me kindly and fairly, or else they are rotten individuals who deserve to suffer. And three, the conditions of life under which I live absolutely must be easy unfrustrating, predictable, secure, and enjoyable, or else the world's an awful place. I can't stand it. I'll never be happy. The, th the three derivative attitudes that this mother attitude um, spawns are, ooh, I'm, 
am I, wait a minute, I'm confused. There you go, bravo. So the three uh, derivative attitudes that the masturbation spawns are known as awfulizing, discomfort disturbance, and devaluation. I should add that when Al released REBT in, in Chicago APA 1956, I believe it was, 56, he had a list of like 10 or 12 um, irrational attitudes. And he constantly refined REBT over his career and, and saw that those those, the, there were four essential underlying factors, and these were those. So there's not like the 12 commandments of Albert Ellis. There, this has been derived, not only crafted by Al, but by scientific research and his colleagues, Ray DiGiuseppe and Wendy Dryden and some others. So the three derivative attitudes, awfulizing. What is awfulizing? It's only, you can only rate things on a scale from 0 to 100. And awfulizing, end of the world thinking, tends to be off the charts, infinitely bad, beyond 100% bad. Now, we argue this is not catastrophizing. What we're talking about, catastrophes exist. I think when one person dies, it's a personal catastrophe to someone. And certainly 9-11 was a catastrophe. What we're going to argue, though, is that catastrophes fall on a badness continuum. Certainly dropping a dirty bomb on Manhattan would be worse than 9-11, where, where the whole island was, was damaged. So awfulizing can often lead to anxiety. It can lead to anger, over-the-top reactions. And we're going to get people to look at things as bad, very bad, terribly bad, but not awful, terrible in the end of the world. Discomfort disturbance involves um, not ha having attitudes that lead to whining about the difficulty involved in either putting up with a certain set of conditions or pursuing a desired goal. Devaluation is an important um, process whereby we rate ourselves. I'm worthless. I'm a failure. I'm a fool. Or we rate you. You're a jerk or perhaps use other words, um, and, and, or we rate the whole of life. The whole of life is bad when we're going through a bad patch. But there, there may be bad chapters in life or bad days, but the whole of life is unlikely to be bad. So we're going to encourage people not to devalue themselves, others, and life. The, old, the antidote to masturbation or this rigid thinking is flexible, preferential, empirically supported thinking. And it is, it is expressed with words like, I want, I wish, I prefer, I desire. In the end, we acknowledge, though, that whatever it is that we badly want, wish, or desire does not have to be. It's an acknowledgment that we don't have to get what we want, that absolutes do not exist. I want my colleagues' cooperation with this project, but I do not absolutely have to have it. The alternatives to the derivatives are, it is bad, very bad perhaps, but not awful, terrible, the end of the world. It's uncomfortable to exercise, but not unbearable. It's uncomfortable to go it alone, but not unbearable in this project. I can, I can do without your help if you're not going to give it to me. People, and then what we're going to teach people is to rate what people do, or perhaps even rate our own or, or others, undesirable characteristics, but acknowledge that fallible humans are in a state of flux. They're evolving, that they're a mix of good, neutral, and bad characteristics, and that you can't really think of someone as a jerk, because he may do a jerky thing, but that fallible human um, is in a state of evolution, and we cannot summate their worth. This is a distinctive aspect of this particular cognitive behavioral therapy. Make no bones about it. So in the end, we're encouraging people to have unconditional self-acceptance, unconditional other acceptance, and unconditional life acceptance. In the words of Epictetus, if you're ever tempted to look for outside approval, realize that you have compromised your integrity. Um, and if you need a witness, in addition, be your own, and you will be all the witness you can desire. What I'm going to, um, I think this is Epictetus talking a little bit or inspiring Albert to think about unconditional self-acceptance. In this, in the, um, we use labels like thief and robber in connection with them, but what do these words mean? They merely signify that people are confused about what is good and what is bad, so we should be angry with them or we should pity them instead. I think these are words that may have inspired Albert to think about unconditional other acceptance and human fallibility. And then here we have don't hope that events will turn out 
the way you want, welcome events in whichever way, this is the path to peace. This may have inspired Al to think about unconditional life acceptance. Um, now, I said REBT is a philosophy, and I truly believe it is. Here are some of the values that we talk about in psychotherapy. We don't push these on people, but we talk about them, we introduce them. So, for example, we speak of enlightened self-interest. What we mean by that is putting ourselves first and others a close second, not a distant second. And that at any given interaction or any given moment or even chapter in our lives, we may put another one, someone else, ahead of ourselves. But in the long run, we really believe that it is better for us to put ourselves first and others a close second. Because if who can, we can't, there's no one else we can really, um, the, the person we could hold best responsible for representing ourselves is ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean that we're selfish. We, we recognize we live in a shared environment and we recommend that we have a social interest, that we be concerned about other people's self-actualization and their, and their plot uh, a lot in life and facilitate their development if at all possible and the ease of their suffering. Um, we also believe in self-direction. So we don't want anybody to accept the values of REBT by themselves. We want you to think them through. We want you also not to accept the values of your family or culture without thinking them through. And then you choose the values that you want to put in motion and strive towards. We certainly recommend high discomfort tolerance and high frustration tolerance because we recognize we live in a world where there will be a challenge all the time trying, uh, working to block us uh, trying to get our goals achieved. And if we don't have high discomfort tolerance and say, oh my God, I can't stand this, we'll back off and not persist and work at things. We certainly advocate that people be open to change, unbigoted, and flexible in their thinking. Now, we also encourage them to relinquish any needs for certainty. We live in a probabilistic world and that once you, in order to live well without anxiety or be paralyzed um, from action, you need to accept that you can't tell in advance whether things are going to go your way and you can tolerate that. We encourage people to find a commitment to creative and meaningful pursuits and, and pursue these pursuits. Simply be, now, now what I have in mind here is political activism, uh, building a family, building a business. For me, it's the dissemination of REBT and stoicism and cognitive behavioral therapy in general. But it doesn't matter what it is. It's your choice, and the, or it could be even more than one. And it is these things that provide some structure and some happiness to, um, um, to your lives. We certainly encourage people to have scientific thinking, use the scientific method, be logical, learn to think logically. We obviously uh, teach people self, other, and life acceptance. I already spoke about that. We encourage people to be able to take calculated risks. Why? Because we live in a world of prior, pro, uh, probability where uh, uncertainty does not exist. And if you're not capable of taking a calculated risk, you're not going to be able to pursue your hopes, dreams, and values. We encourage people to um, become long-term hedonists and do what we call the hedonic calculus where we take into account our decisions and actions of the moment and how they will affect our health, wealth, and well-being in the future. We encourage people to see that they will never perfect themselves, others, and that there are no utopias and that that's acceptable. We can accept that. And certainly we encourage people not to blame others for their emotional disturbance but to take responsibility for that. Here's a quote by Epictetus suggesting the hedonic calculus. As with impressions, if you get an impression of something pleasurable, watch it, you, that you're not carried away with it. Take a minute, let the matter wait on you, then reflect on both intervals of time. The time contrast that with how happy you will be, be if you, how happy, you, how pleased you will be if you abstain. So I'm cutting this short so we can stay on time here, but here uh, Epictetus is talking about think about the consequences and you may very well be happy for refraining from engaging in a pleasurable pursuit. My wish to you is that you consider learning more about REBT as you continue to study Stoicism. I think REBT can help you implement the teachings of Epictetus and other Stoic philosophers. Like Stoicism, in my estimation, it's a tough-minded philosophy that holds out well when your worst nightmare or adversity occurs. I think 
that this is a unique aspect of, of REBT that it has over other cognitive behavioral therapies, simply because we're not chasing inferences. We're not saying, well, if you restructure that idea, it might, it might not look so bad. We're saying, let's assume the worst, and maybe you can prevail, you can tolerate it, you can even accept its existence just because all the conditions are exist for that particular reality to exist. So we really don't, at first at least, go after inferential types of thinking. And this is a little how it differs, I think, from Stoicism. I think if you adopt REBT, or at least learn more about it, it may help you live virtuously as, as a fallible human in a difficult world. <laughs> I'd like to suggest for those of you who are involved in counseling or coaching that you consider uh, taking a look at my recent book. It's called The Newcomer's Guide to Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. Um, I would suggest that all of you pick up one of my wallet cards. It has eight ideas on it, and these ideas are really the core ideas of REBT, and perhaps take a few of them and give them to your friends and lovers. You can go to my uh, website and uh, learn more about REBT, or you can maybe purchase one of these books that Al wrote, he wrote many, and put it next to your copy of the um, discourses or, or the meditations and go back and forth between the two. You can see that from the titles of the book, books that they are quite stoic, uh, particularly how to stubbornly refuse to be miserable about anything as anything and how to control your anger before it controls you. I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention and Don, thank you for your hard work. <laughs>